The Apostle Paul, in these pastoral epistles, is writing to Timothy and to Titus to exhort and challenge them with respect to the leadership of the early churches that he had been so instrumental in planting, realizing that his life would soon end and realizing that uh, every leader is really a leader that must be conscious of passing down the faith and training the next generation of leaders. Paul is training Timothy. And it would appear as you read through these epistles that Timothy was at times somewhat feeble in his mindset. Many times Paul the apostle had to remind him to be bold, to be of good courage, to take the right stand, and to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And time and time again we see that Paul was uh, admonishing Timothy in these ways. We also know on one occasion that the apostle Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. And some have wondered if there perhaps was some type of an infirmity, perhaps some, some type of a, of a weakness or an ailment in his life. And, and perhaps even that could have been due to some type of stress with respect to the idea of, of looking into the needs of a church uh, such as Ephesus or other such ministries. And, and whatever the cause or the case, Timothy was a man that needed uh, much exhortation. And we are the benefactors of reading these epistles because it gives us some insight into what is necessary in the ministry and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come to this particular chapter tonight, we find that Timothy, who would be surrounded with warfare, battles, doubts, and difficulties, would have one great resource that Paul was concerned that he should use. And that one great resource, besides the Word of God itself, is the resource of prayer. The, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, being the primary offensive weapon, but prayer would be so needed in Timothy's life. And many churches tonight have programs and singing and activities, and, and, and yet they're not seeing God's hand of blessing, and there's oftentimes a, a shallowness. There's a, a lack of appetite for spiritual things. There's not an anointing of God. There's a difference between seeing an opportunity and really knowing that there's an anointing. There's a difference between doing services and really having the presence of God. There's a difference between admonishing someone and counseling with someone and doing such with the power of God. And Paul knew that Timothy would need this anointing. He would need the power of God upon his life. I often tell church planters and, and young preachers and thank the Lord in College Chapel this past week uh, on uh, Thursday, I believe we had more than 20 young men surrender their lives to be preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what a blessing and how we thank God that he is still calling such men. But I often tell these young men that more than they need a website, more than they need a, uh, a fancy jingle or a song or some, uh, some uh, fancy decor or lighting package or some kind of entertainment form, more than all of those things, what they desperately need is the power of God on their life. And we come tonight to a man, Timothy, who Paul in his seasoned assessment could look and say to him, Timothy, you're going to have to learn how to pray, son. You're going to have to learn how to get a hold of the throne of grace in order to provide the needs of the people. To know the needs of the people, Timothy, you're going to spend time with the people, but to know the solutions for the people, you're going to have to learn how to spend time with God. Christianity is much dependent in the proper sense on prayer. Prayer. No prayer, no power. Little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. Prayer is the key to power in the Christian life. Now, as we begin tonight, we notice the priority of prayer. The Bible says in verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Interesting word, exhort. He's encouraging. Uh, he is uh, coming alongside of Timothy like uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in coming alongside of us. Paul is coming alongside of this young man and he's exhorting him with respect to something that he needs. 
And because of Timothy's call to ministry and his charge to continue at the church at Ephesus, Paul is exhorting him in this matter of prayer. In fact, notice the priority. He says, I exhort, thee there, I exhort therefore that first of all, he said the, 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 the priority here, Timothy, is going to need to be on prayer. And one of the reasons that we're establishing a few extra prayer times and that we're involved in a a, a 40-day prayer journal and one of the reasons I'm preaching these messages is because God says, first of all, prayer. And and it must become a greater priority in many of our lives in 2022. We're we're talking about things that we cannot handle in uh, legislation or in our own uh, abilities or connections or relations. We're talking about things that are happening in our country, in our community, in our church, in our families, that we must have God's intervention. That's the only answer. We must have God. And so he says, first of all, Paul is prioritizing this admonition, and he's encouraging Timothy to make prayer a priority. Warren Wiersbe said the local church does not pray because it is expected, the expected thing to do. It prays because prayer is vital to the life of the church. And tonight as we see the priority of prayer, we learn in this passage a few very important lessons. Notice, first of all, we learn how to pray. In verse number one, we see these instructions and we see God teaching us how to pray. And we see a few words that are very significant in lessons of prayer. Notice, first of all, the word supplications. This word means entreaties or requests. And we learn that prayer is asking. Now, I hope you have a prayer list. I I would challenge everyone to have a prayer list. I have a prayer list that I uh, keep, and, and uh, it's a, a current relevant list. I have, I have other lists. I pray for the church family on a list. I pray for the deacons. I pray for uh, a group of pastors. I pray for our staff. I pray for many people on these many lists, uh, and yet I also have a, a list that I keep current. I had Brother Jim Harris on that list recently, and thank the Lord he's home, and God answered that prayer. And I've been uh, praying for uh, Mark Kelly, uh, one of our young men of our church. The Kellys are a dear family, and their son has been in the hospital and uh, struggling for breath, and we're praying that maybe tonight uh, the doctors will let him come home. Maybe tomorrow if his oxygen levels will get up high enough, and I've been praying for him. Many years ago, one of our dear ladies in our church, Mrs. Nancy Whitman, she gave me the, uh, 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 the uh, wool uh, uh, off of a sheep, uh, and, and, I, and, and, and she said, I saw this on the movie Chef. How many of you remember that old movie, Sheffy? And she said, I thought you might like to have a prayer cloth like this and, and, a, and, a, and a place to go. And I spend time in the mornings uh, uh, on that chair and with that, uh, with that sheep's hide as an under-shepherd praying for the sheep, the flock at Lancaster Baptist Church. And much of what I'm doing there is by way of supplication. God, don't let that man have to miss much more work. I I know it's an important job. It's overtime. But Lord, I'm worried. Oh, God, spare him from getting too far away from you. God, heal this man who's in the hospital. God, help this woman whose husband left her. God, give me wisdom to know how to help the teenagers of the church. So many of them got into so much wicked internet during uh, during these last two years years being shut off at home, and God, uh, help our governor to be saved, and the council members, and on and on, and, and supplication, and praying. John R. Rice said, prayer is asking, and I'm saying tonight, we need to start doing more asking at Lancaster Baptist Church, because God can still mend families, and heal sickness, and save souls, and only God can give a miracle on February 20th. This pastor cannot do it. This congregation cannot do it. Only God can can open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Supplication. So many people say, well, I wish I could see more of this or that or soul saved or this or that. May I ask you a question? Are you supplicating tonight before God? So many times we ask men, but we don't ask God. And people aren't very shy about asking stuff anymore. People ask for favors and loans and money and jobs and people ask for different hours and vacation and all these things that people want. But may I ask you, have you come to God with your request? Paul said, Timothy, you need to learn that prayer is supplication. It's asking. And I believe tonight 
many of us need to get a prayer list going. You need to get a place. You need to get a time with the Lord where you spend time. Husbands, pray for your wife. Pray for your wife. I said at the couple's retreat, it's hard to be on your knees praying for your wife and get up and argue with her. Pray for your children. I pray for my children every day, though they're grown. I pray for their spouses. I pray for my grandchildren. I pray that they'll be saved at an early age. I pray that they'll one day be wise in their friendships and, and in their dating and in their marriage. I pray for that now. I pray for it daily. I go through and pray for those 11 precious grandchildren. I ask God to put a protective hedge about them. Oh, listen tonight, we must see the priority. First of all, prayer. First of all, prayer. So many times we use prayer as the, as the emergency tire. and We use it as the spare tire. We have a, uh, if, if everything else is going wrong, we're going to start praying. But God says in his word, I want you first of all to come to me and pray. And then he says not only supplications, but then we see in verse 1 this word prayers. Uh, uh, this is uh, addressed toward God in the act of devotion devotion to God. It is the time when we may adore God, when we may praise God for who He is, when we uh, speak of His attributes, when we acknowledge our needfulness uh, in prayer. It is, it is lifting Him up. Prayer, prayer is asking uh, in the form of supplication. Prayer is worshiping God in the sense of communicating to Him what you think of Him. Sometimes it's embarrassing to me because I feel that people who worship false gods sometimes have more dedication than we do. I still remember so clearly living in Seoul, South, in Seoul, South Korea, and every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'd hear these dong, 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 the Buddhist temple. Dong, and, and the Buddhist temple in our neighborhood calling the people and people rising up early and walking up to, to their stone God. Eyes have they, but they cannot see. Ears have they, but they cannot hear. And people that would then kneel down before a statue of Buddha, people that would bring money. I've seen it many times. People that would bring uh, fruits and vegetables. You can see it today, downtown Seoul, Korea, not far uh, from, from uh, the, the Seoul Plaza Hotel. Not far from there is a, is a, is a large, large uh, statue of Buddha and people going and, and going early in the morning and throughout the day and kneeling. And I mean kneeling for a long time and singing to Buddha and praying to Buddha with such great emotion and fervor and many times the average Christian, if they pray for their Cheerios, you're lucky. I guess we don't have any needs. I guess we have no love for God. How many of you believe that God wants to hear from us this week? Amen. Terry and I, we, our kids are all raised. We, we like to get them to come over when they can or bring the grandkids, but a lot of times it's us and our dog who lives in the house with us, and our cat who lives outside. <laughs> Sometimes we let them inside when it's real cold outside. Now, could you imagine if I were to spend a seven-day period in that house with Terry and never speak to her? No. Number one, she's there. I see her many times in the morning, in the evenings. Number two, she's the love of my life. She's been such a faithful blessing for 41 years to me. Many times when I'll see her during, during the day, I'll say, you okay? Need anything? Sure love you. I'll see you in a little while. There's someone else that lives with us. His name is Jesus. I don't want to go through the day and walk through those hallways without talking to him. I don't want to start my day without kneeling down to him and worshiping him and telling him how great he is and telling him how much I need him. Oh, we say Jesus is in our heart. We say he's in our life, but do you talk to him? Supplication, prayer, first of all, first of all, I believe we ought to all begin our day in prayer. 
Begin it with the Lord. Supplication, prayer. Notice the third word here is the word intercessions. Now, intercessions mean to petition on the behalf of another. It is to come in conversation with God for someone else. And many times our prayer lists are for other people. Oftentimes people give me a prayer request. I stand in the West Wing lobby and people say, I've got a surgery tomorrow. I've got this problem. Uh, and, 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 I, and I'll jot that down and I'll put it on my prayer list. I, I, I'm not smart enough to remember all of them. I've got to write it down if I'm going to remember. And I figure the Lord's okay if you open your eyes during your prayer times and sometime and look at your list and, and bring these petitions before the Lord. An interceding prayer. Oh, what a blessing intercession has been in my life during this COVID. I, I have friends all around the world that we were scheduled to see and be with and preach for. And, and, and I think of so many in Australia. I think of so many in the Philippines and in Africa. I think of friends that are serving in the mission fields around the world in Canada. We haven't seen them. And sometimes we haven't had opportunity to, to worship and sing and preach together and attend conferences together. But we can pray for them and we can be with them in prayer intercession. Prayer is asking. Prayer is worshiping. Prayer is interceding. Notice there in the verse, and giving of thanks. Prayer is thanksgiving. Giving gratitude to God. Now, two definitions explain this phrase. Thankfulness is the attitude in prayer, and giving of thanks is the action of prayer. Isn't it interesting over in Philippians, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving. God says, don't forget when you're asking me about such and so to give thanks for the stuff that's going well. Don't forget when you're asking me for more stuff to be thankful for the other stuff. Don't forget uh, when you're asking me for provision uh, to be reminded of all that I've already provided for you. And, and I oftentimes see uh, in, in, a, in a week of, of, of ministry people that are so unhappy and there's no smile and, and, and the husband will be unhappy and so then the wife is unhappy and the children wonder what's going on. And oftentimes it's a focus on the one or two problems and, and, and not really realizing, hey, you could walk to church tonight. Hey, you've got salvation. Hey, you've got many blessings in your life. And that's why God says, when you're asking me for other stuff, don't forget what I've already done for you. Amen. Gratitude. Ian e. Bounds, who's a great author on prayer, wrote, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. Do you pray? Do you talk to God? I remember years ago, we were just getting going in the ministry here. And, uh, and, and lots of things were happening. We had building programs and school starting. And I think, honey, maybe we had started a college. And it was just, it was crazy. Just so many things going on. And Terry and I said when we first got married, if we ever reached a point in our marriage where there was friction or things weren't going well, we would go get counseling. We would not say that because we are in the ministry, we can't get help sometimes. And so uh, we were just, we just were so busy. And a lot of it was my fault. And Terry wasn't super happy. And I said, all right, I'm going to schedule a meeting. We're going to go get some counseling. So we went in for counseling. As I said yesterday, when you go in for counseling, you're normally convinced it's not you that needs it. It's probably your spouse that needs it somehow. <laughs> and we sat down in the office of this man, and his office made me so nervous. It was so dirty. I wanted to clean it for him. <laughs> Dr. Crabb, I thought to myself, how can this man counsel me his office is so dirty. His life is a mess. It's a shambles. Let me clean his office, and I'll counsel him for a while. <laughs> that's, part, that's partly why I'm probably so anxious, you know, that type A. We sat there in that office. That man came in. We shared a few things with him about how the church had grown, how we didn't want to have a, a, a marriage that wasn't right in the midst of all the blessedness of God. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, well, tell me how long you spend praying with your wife. I was a young pastor, and I thought to myself, well, we pray for the Cheerios. <laughs> tell me about your prayer life. And he challenged me that first of all, you need to pray. First of all, 
you need to pray. I don't know what's troubling you tonight, but is prayer in its proper place in your life? Do your children hear you pray? Do you pray with your family? Do you have a prayer list? Are you praying for people to be saved? Are you praying for your pastor? Did you know that I need your prayer? Did you know that Paul said, brethren, pray for us? Do you pray for your spouse? Are you praying for February 20th? Are we praying for our missionaries? Prayer, first of all, giving thanks. A new Bible college was in a critical need of $10,000 to keep the doors open. During a prayer meeting, Harry Ironside prayed, Lord, you who own the cattle on a thousand hills, please sell some of those cattle to help us meet this need. Shortly after the prayer meeting, a check for $10,000 arrived at the school, sent days earlier by a friend who had no idea about the need. He was a cattle man who had sold some of his cattle. <laughs> prayer. Amen. Prayer. First of all, prayer. Prayer is supplication or asking. Prayer is worshiping. Prayer is interceding. And prayer is giving of thanks. There are many models to prayer that we have learned over the years. If you want to take just that verse and write it out on a card and just pray that way tomorrow, it really doesn't matter as long as you are praying and seeking the face of God. This is how we pray. We pray with supplication. We pray with prayers. We pray with intercession for other people's needs. We, we pray by giving thanks to the Lord. But then notice, secondly, who do we pray for? Who do we pray for? What an amazing statement is made in verse number one. It says that prayer be made for all men. For all men. Speaking here, the word men, anthropos, humans, all, all people, everybody. Look at You can't pray for the wrong person. Do you pray for your boss? Do you pray for your neighbor? Look at I don't know. Who's bugging you in this world? But there's 8 billion people. One of them probably is bugging you. Do you pray for them? We should pray for people. We should ask God to help and to bless them. Terry and I had lunch today, and there's a dear lady that, that we've witnessed to and given tracts to her. And, and uh, a lot of times she's just not happy. Just not, just not happy. And... Um, Oftentimes, you try to encourage her, and it just doesn't seem to help as much. And I told Terry today at lunch, I said, you know, I feel sorry for her. We need to pray for her. There's a burden in her life. Pray for people. You cannot pray for the wrong person. All men need prayer. And then notice, secondly, pray for rulers, those in authority, those who have a superior rank, those that maybe are called kings or presidents or governors or congressmen or mayors, they need our prayer. Sometimes they need our voice. They need to know if we think something's going well or not so well, but they need our prayer. They need to know that we are praying for them. The needs today, the challenges of leadership are greater than ever. So many just want to check out. So many want to find a place far away from all the problems. And the problems for the good leaders are overwhelming because they're being faced with this crazy uh, agenda that so many times is anti-authority, anti-God. We see that many schools this year uh, throughout America, in fact, this week, are, are teaching the 13 principles of Black Lives Matter, which include the disassembling of the nuclear family and such things, and school boards are speaking out against it, and Christian parents are saying, what is going on here? And the idea that every one of this race is a racist and every one of this race is a racist and just, just somehow fomenting angst and anger. And, and if you're a school principal today, if you're, if you're someone that's uh, trying to do well in, a, in an elected official position, it is a very difficult time to lead. And these people need our prayers tonight. And they should be on our prayer list. I called our uh, sheriff's captain here in Lancaster this week, and I've shared briefly the gospel with him. He's new, and he's a very kind man. And uh, I've had some concerns I shared with him and, uh, about some safety issues, and uh, I hope none of you got a ticket. I asked him to have some black and whites on K and J doing traffic stops. 
And uh, we've just had a, we've had some young people just blazing down these roads with an incredibly dangerous speed. And I have a safety concern for our members and our college students and so forth. And I just called him. I said, I'd like to ask you to set this up. He said, he said, I will. And thank you for letting me know. And, and then he began to share with me some of the challenges that he's having to, play, to face right now. He shared with me, he said, I'm glad you told me that. I can tell them to go there, but they can't just go somewhere now because of some new policies that have been laid out. It has to come down from the captain because if they just go there, then they might be seemingly profiling or something. And, and he said, basically, many times it's becoming more difficult for the officers just to do their job. So thank you for telling me this because I can help them do their job. And I said to him, I said, Captain, I'm going to pray for you. I want that man to know that he has a Baptist preacher in this town who will pray for him. I'm commanded to pray for those that are in authority. I pray for our city council members, and they know I pray for them. You say, well, you don't always agree with everything so-and-so does. No, I don't always agree with everything every politician does, but I can pray for them. I can pray for them to be saved. I've prayed for many of them. I've prayed for our congressman, Kevin McCarthy and Garcia and all these in their offices. But I can intercessory pray here in intercession from Lancaster for them, no matter where they are. The Bible says we're to pray for all men. We're to pray for those that are in authority. The Roman emperor Nero, who was the Nero, uh, emperor at this time, was, uh, was uh, going to begin killing Christians. He was angry at Christians. And Paul's saying, don't forget to pray for Nero. Don't forget to lift him up in your prayers. Folks, it doesn't matter who the leaders are. We're commanded to pray for them. I don't agree with leaders who push abortion. I don't agree with leaders who limit uh, our, our police officers or uh, somehow defund them or whatever. I, I don't agree necessarily with those that might uh, be involved in uh, some kind of an agenda that has uh, maybe a, a hurtful ramifications for the family. But I can still pray for them. Pray that God would touch their heart and change their heart. J. Sidlow Baxter said, Men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against their prayers. I think sometimes I miss my grandmother and my mother most of all because of their prayers. My grandmother had a long prayer list. I think of my friend Mark Lawrence. We have a dorm named after him. If you want to go in that dorm sometime, see one of the college faculty and walk in. There in the glass case, you'll see his Bible, and the Bible is open to a flyleaf. And on the inside flap of the flyleaf were the people that he prayed every morning for. And on the top left was Pastor Chapel. I'm so glad I was on his prayer list. I know he prayed for me. Dr. Rick Martin in the Philippines, our dear friend, I mention him so often, pray for his wife. I think, Mrs. First, maybe every three months they send to me and they say, the following students of Iloilo Baptist Church are praying and fasting for Pastor Chapel this month. And they send me a list of who's praying and fasting for me from the Philippines. I wonder, is anyone here praying for their pastor in this church? Prayer. Pray for those that are in authority. And pray for all men. Pray for those that are in authority. We see how to pray. We see who to pray for. And then we see why to pray. Notice in verse 2 it says, For kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You see, if, if we're going to have a quiet life, a tranquil life, it's because we pray. The word quiet carries the idea of the absence of outside disturbance. The word peaceable carries the idea of the absence of inside turbulence. And, and God is telling us to pray for those in authority so that we might be able to go along serving God peaceably and safely, that we might have quiet, that we might have peace. Wearsby said, prayer helps to maintain the peace of society. Listen to me. This city and the mayor and the council member, they have somewhat of an idea, but probably do not realize the great asset of the Lancaster Baptist Church if all we did was pray for this city. You say, well, isn't there an economic impact of Lancaster Baptist, West Coast Baptist College? One time we did a study on that, and yes, there is. It's millions and millions of dollars. But greater than the economic impact of this ministry on this city should be the prayer impact of this ministry on this city. 
Every city needs a strong, Bible-believing, praying church right in the middle of it, caring enough to pray. Why do we pray? We pray for quiet. We pray for peace. But notice what else we pray for. It says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Notice this, in all godliness and honesty. We need to pray that our city would remain a place with godliness and a place with honesty. We need to play, pray a protective hedge around the city. Say, well, there's a lot of sin in the city. That's why we need to pray. There are some cities that have reached a tipping point where the leadership don't even consider what Christians might think. They don't even have a God consciousness. They have no restraining power in the city because there's no prayer power in the city. You recognize it's not about having a majority of Christians. It's about having praying Christians. It's about having people that pray uh, for godliness and for honesty. R.A. Torrey said the chief purpose of prayer is that God may be glorified in the answer. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And notice in verse 3 what the Bible says, for this, this prayer life, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is a good thing. There ought to be prayer. I remember when the uh, airplanes were hijacked by the Islamic terrorist and they flew into the trade towers in New York City and I remember uh, the horror that we felt within our hearts and the hurt that we felt in our hearts and we had just finished this auditorium and, uh, uh, and I remember folks coming in uh, and, and just uh, really no scheduled services members of the church, members of the community people that had never been to this church before and they were coming into this auditorium they were kneeling down and they were crying out to God and they were asking God that it wouldn't happen again, they were asking God why did it happen and some of those people accepted Christ as their Savior. And I want you to understand that we don't have to wait for the crises to pray. We can pray. What a privilege we have. What a friend we have in Jesus. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The priority of prayer. Paul said, Timothy, if you're going to be a leader, you better be a prayer warrior. You better learn that the power comes from the place of prayer. Notice quickly the purpose of God in all of this. What is the purpose of God in all of this? Why do we want to have quiet and peaceable lives and good and, and, and live the good and acceptable way in the sight of God? Why? Notice verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Somehow this prayer and this peaceable lifestyle that is granted through prayer is connected to the salvation of lost souls. Don't you know that the Chinese Christians pray that they would have opportunity to get out of their little hiding places so that they can witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? And God says, I want you to pray so that you can live peaceably. Why? So that the purpose of God can be fulfilled. And someone says, well, what is the purpose of God anyways? Uh, what, is the, what is the plan of God? Well, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Notice the purpose of God is the salvation of all. The salvation of all. Notice this, if you would, in verse number four. Who will have all men to be saved. Let's say that together. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This word will is the desire of God, the intention of God. I believe it is the will of God that every man would be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Prayer should be made for all people. All people need the grace of God. All people need the mercy of God. And does not this verse remind us that God's desire is for all to be saved and that Jesus died for all? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John Christosom from Antioch wrote, Since he wishes that all should be saved, do you also wish it? And if you wish it, pray for it. For prayer is the instrument of effecting such things. May I encourage you to place on your prayer list the names of lost people. Parents, aunts, uncles, co-workers, pray for them. Pray that they will be saved. 
We encourage all of our staff here and all of our faithful soul winners to keep a prospect list. Many of you use different apps and you put names on those apps and some use pieces of paper. Why did I begin encouraging that years ago? Well, so we'd stay organized, yes. So we'd maybe know who to visit or maybe write a note to, yes. But one of the main reasons for that list, and we've said it so often, is to pray for that list. Before you go to the home on Saturday morning, before you go to the home on Thursday night, God, I'm praying for John. I pray he'll be home Thursday. God, open his heart as I speak to him. Pray for them. Why? Because God is not willing that any should perish. Because the word of God tells us here that he will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why we pray for missionaries. That's why the college students have a missionary prayer band. Why? Because we want to pray for continents and nations and cities and counties and people who need the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 4 and 10, the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. Ezekiel 18, 23, God wanted the wicked to turn from their ways and live. Titus 2, 11, the grace of God that brings salvation appears to all men. John 3, 17, is clear that God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. 1 Timothy 4 and 10, for therefore we labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. I believe tonight that the blood of Jesus Christ is efficacy for the sin of the entire world. I believe that whosoever will may come and be saved. And I refuse to believe uh, that God is so hateful in heaven that he uh, condemns some to hell and others to heaven. I believe that God, uh, yes, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He knows who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. But there's a compatibility uh, between his foreknowledge and the free free will of men. And I believe that all men everywhere can be saved. And we need to start praying for them to be saved. It's God's will that people would be saved. Oh, the blood will never lose its power, but the church must never stop its praying. The salvation of all. And then the knowledge of truth. The Bible says in verse 4, to come to the knowledge of the truth, a precise and correct knowledge of Not so much an intellectual comprehension, a spiritual discernment. To come to the knowledge of God and his will for their life. W.A. Criswell, the great pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, once wrote, The truth under the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit leads the man away from his reformations, away from his good works. Listen, you can learn all the steps in in Alcoholics Anonymous and still die and go to hell for all of eternity. Christianity is not self-reformation. Christianity is about salvation through Jesus Christ. And Criswell said, the Holy Spirit leads a man from his own reformations, away from his own good works, away from his own pride, and boasting of the worth of his own life and the deeds that he has done, and it leads him to a humble, supplicant, power and prayerful repentance towards Jesus Christ. Spurgeon said one thing more. The soul winner must be a master of the art of prayer. You cannot bring souls to God if you don't go to God yourself. Teachers, parents, teenagers, make a prayer list. Put the names of lost people on your prayer list. Ask God for their soul to be saved. The priority of prayer is seen first of all. The purpose of God is clear. He wants us praying so that all men everywhere can hear the gospel and be saved. And then notice finally tonight the provision of Christ. I want you to see how Christ has made a way for us. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus here we see a wonderful truth. Uh, uh, we, we understand that there is one God and that there is one mediator between God and men. Now, he, notice concerning Christ here in verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. We learn that Christ here in the Scripture is God in the flesh. There is one God who exists in three persons, the Trinity, the triune Godhead. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. But of Christ, the Bible says in Colossians 2 and verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
The Unitarians falsely deny the Trinity of Christ. Polytheists falsely deny uh, that, there, uh, that there is uh, one God. The Mormons say that Adam was God and uh, Satan was God and, and uh, you can become God. But the fact of the matter is that there are three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each of them carry the attributes of deity, and each of them are God, and all of them together in the Trinity are God. There is God here in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a fully God and fully man. Jesus is God in the flesh. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. And notice what it says here in verse 5, the man Christ Jesus, speaking of the humanity of Jesus Christ, his in incarnation. And Jesus, as the God-man, became the mediator between God and men. This is why he came. This is why he was conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary and came to this earth in the form of a man so that he could become the mediator. He was fully man and fully God. And we know that he is God, but here Paul is emphasizing that he was the God-man, the, the man Christ Jesus. And as the man, 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also hath once suffered for, this, for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, that he might bring us to to God. How many of you are glad he brought you to God? No church can bring you to God. You can't bring yourself to God. No politician can bring you to God. There's only one way to be brought to God, and that is by the way of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Mary is not the mediator. Many Roman Catholics are taught to believe, and they, they pray to Mary. And they're taught also that she is the co-redemptrix and that you pray to Mary and that she can help you get your sins taken care of and get your prayers up to God. And this is heresy. There is, there is no mediation to be made through Mary. Mary was highly favored among women, but she was not above women. She's not one that we are to pray to. She's not an object of prayer. You don't see statues around this auditorium. We don't pray to the saints. We have one mediator, and his name is Jesus Christ. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven, whereby you must be saved. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is our mediator. He is the one that brings us to the Father in salvation. Yes, and he's also made a new and a living way for our fellowship with God and for our prayers to God that we can come boldly to the throne of grace because of the blood that was shed. He is God in the flesh. He is our mediator. Thirdly, he is the Savior. Notice in verse 6 the Bible says, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Notice the work of Jesus, our Savior, the work of ransom Ransom is what is given in exchange for a captive slave. It is the price of substitution. We owed a debt we could not pay. No way, no how. Look, at you could not knock enough doors. I don't care what the Jehovah's Witnesses say about becoming one of the 144,000. First of all, the 144,000 are Jewish males. That's a huge problem for most JWs. And secondly, you could never knock on enough doors to earn your way to heaven. You can never give enough money to earn your way to heaven. There's no way to do enough to go to heaven. There, there's a great price that we had to pay. And the ransom that needed to be paid, we could never pay. But Jesus Christ paid the ransom when he shed his blood. 1 John 2 and 2. And he is the propitiation. He is the payment for our sins and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. Look at His blood covers the sin of the entire world. He is the ransom for all. Moody said, the thief had nails through both hands so that he could not work. He had nails through each foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot towards his salvation, and yet Christ offered him the gift of God, and he took it. Christ threw him a passport, and he took it to paradise. He could not be baptized. He could not go to Sunday school. He could only believe. And that was all that was required to receive the ransom. We see 
the work of our Savior is the work of the ransom. But notice there in verse 6 as we close, who gave himself a ransom for all, notice this, to be testified in due time. Would you say that with me, please? To be to be testified in due time. That's our responsibility. Jesus paid the price. We are to testify. This is due time. It is due time that Lancaster Baptist Church gets out of second gear, gets out of COVID gear, gets up into third gear, gets into fourth gear, gets into overtime. It is due time. It is high time. Jesus has paid the ransom. Your neighbor needs to know it. The bus kids need to know it. The juniors need to know it. The teenagers need to know it. This community needs to know that Jesus Christ paid the ransom and it is due time to let this community know. But we must first of all begin with prayer. That's where the power is. That's where the blessedness is. That's where the inner man is renewed for some of you that feel a little older and tired. Prayer. The story is told of a poor man who lived in Eastern Europe in the 1900s. And I hope, hope you'll pray for the country of Ukraine. Russia has 130,000 troops on the border, and we're sending bullets and a few men. Eastern Europeans have had a difficult time since the Iron Curtain fell, and now it looks like the Iron Curtain may draw upon people once again. The story is told about a poor man who lived in Eastern Europe in the early 1900s. He was seeking a better life for himself and his family. He scraped together enough money and finally was able to get enough money for a third-class ticket on a steamship all the way to New York City. He planned to find work and one day send for his family to come and join him. Having exhausted nearly all of his money for the passage, he subsisted for the 12-day journey on a wheel of hard cheese that he'd brought in a bag. And he had some little crackers and some cheese. And for the 12-day journey, that's all he ever ate. He looked longingly through the dining window. He saw people in the dining window eating sumptuously, but he stayed in his room and ate his cheese. He would retreat there for his ration. On the final day of the voyage, with the Statue of Liberty now in sight, with hope coming and dawning upon people's hearts, the man was standing once again at the railing and just looking at the people having their meal in the dining room. A steward came to him. He said, I don't mean to pry, but why haven't we seen you in the dining room this week? The traveler explained, well, I, I didn't have any money for all of that. I, I just brought cheese and crackers. And the steward said, well, did you not know that three meals a day are included in your ticket? We set you a place every day, but you never came. Church. God has set you a place every day, but some of you never come. God wants to meet with you. God wants to bless you. God wants to feed you. God wants you to sense his presence. God wants to use you to lead someone to Jesus. God wants to help you with your finances. God wants to help you with your health. He's, he sets the table. He says, come in boldly. Come on in. Come on in. You don't have to stand out there eating crackers and cheese. Come on in. First of all, come, come first. Come first here. Before you go to the welfare line, before you go to Facebook and complain, before you start getting counsel from your unsafe, come, come here first. The table's set. First of all, church, first of all, prayer and supplication. May we walk with Jesus this week. May we not live like he's not in our hearts and not in our house, but may we seek his face in 2022. Would you stand with me, please? Father, forgive us for our prayerlessness. Jesus, forgive us for walking around the house, the dorm, the city without talking to you. Oh, God, we have so much that we need, revival, safety, souls, jobs, health. God, forgive us for not coming to the table that you've set.